Thanks for checking out this week's podcast from Center Street Church. We pray it blesses, encourages, and inspires you. So I would, I am sure that you would agree with me that we live in an age of rage. We see it everywhere. We see it in our homes, our schools. We see it on our place of work. And of course, man, do we see it on our city streets and on Deerfoot, right? Each year in Canada, do you know that there's over 360,000 children who witness or experience family violence? Are you aware that in Calgary alone, our city police are called to respond to over 19,000 domestic violence incidences every year, and that number is growing rapidly. In fact, over the last four months, it's gone up 30%. Every day we see and hear numerous accounts of the carnage created by uncontrolled anger. Now... We often think that those people that are like that are criminals and all the rest, but most of them are people like you and me that just, at some point, lose it. Now, of course, there are always those who say, I don't have an anger problem. And when people say that, sometimes, you know, and I agree that there are people that maybe don't, but I'm tempted to give them the test. You know what the test is? Well, there's probably many tests, but one that I really like is the one that's been suggested by Doug Fields. He says, if you really want to find out if a person has an anger problem, uh, call them up at 1 o'clock in the morning and say something like, hi, is Dave there? And what you'll get, you know, chances are they'll probably say something like, no, you've got the wrong number. You know, it's 1 o'clock in the morning, buddy. And Doug says that's an example of annoyance. Now, if you want an example of anger, call him back an hour later. (laughs) And say, hi, is Dave there? And what you'll probably get then is, no, I told you an hour ago that there is no Dave here. This is the second time you woke me up, buddy. You have completely wrecked my sleep. I can't believe you would do that. Check your number, will you? Now, Doug says, if you want to see rage, call him again at 3 a.m. and say, hi, this is Dave. Have I got any messages? Please don't do that. But seriously, how are you doing in this matter of anger? What is really ticking you off of late? Is it a spouse that consistently puts you down in front of others? Is it someone that you're wanting to have a serious relationship with who expresses interest in you one day and then in someone else the next day? Is it a boss who just doesn't hear you or doesn't respect you or makes you feel like, you know, that you're just not an important part of the team? Is it a roommate or members of your family who again and again just seem to take advantage of your graciousness and your generosity? Or or is it a harsh and demeaning words of a teacher or a coach, a parent, a child, maybe one of your brothers or sisters or a fellow student? If we're honest, we've all spoken and have been on the receiving end of angry, hurtful words. We know what it means to be angry. In fact, some of you may be angry right now. My question is, how are you going to deal with that anger? Now, before I address that, I should point out that, you know, not all anger is sinful. Ephesians 4.26 says this, In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Notice the verse says, In your anger, do not sin. In other words, it's saying that anger, like love, is a God-given emotion that in and of itself isn't wrong. It's why we're angry and the way we express our anger where our anger can actually become sinful. For example, Jesus was spit upon, he was beaten, he was mocked, he was crucified, and yet he didn't retaliate, nor did he make any threats. He said, Father, forgive them. 
You see, he didn't get angry when people hurt him. But he did get angry, didn't he? He got angry when people defiled the holiness of God. He got angry when unjust things were done to other people. He got angry when people's motives were jaded or when they didn't care about other people. And so, if you see an injustice and you say to yourself, I can't stand that, and it prompts you to do something about that, that is really a form of righteous anger. Or if, for example, you're angry because no one's stepping up to lead a small group of youth. And it bothers you to the point where you can't stand the thought that there are youth not receiving the positive mentoring that you received when you were a kid. And so you step up and you agree to lead a small group of youth. You see, the anger that you felt rising up within you that led you to mentor youth and get engaged is really a form of righteous anger. Because it's not about you and your agenda, it's actually about God's agenda investing in the lives of other people. Now, on the other hand, sinful anger grows out of self-interest. You're angry because you didn't get your way, or because you were ignored, or because you were embarrassed, or because um, your pride was hurt. And this sinful anger often leads to ungodly attitudes and behaviors. Which brings me back to the question I asked a moment ago. How do we deal with anger in our lives? Well, first of all, when angry, stop and just say no to destructive anger. You know, we can't avoid feelings of anger, but we can learn to control our anger. Some people try to justify their sinful anger by saying, well, it's just the way I am. You know, I just can't help it. I just lose it, and I blow up. Well, look at what Ephesians 4.31 says. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. When Paul says get rid of it, he's saying... We've got a lot of control over how we express our anger. Now, I realize that there are instances when a person has a physical or a biochemical condition that make it very difficult to control their anger. But for most of us, and particularly those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, with the Spirit's help, we can control how we express our anger. I mean, have you ever been in a heated discussion with someone otherwise known as a fight, you know, with your spouse or a roommate or with a brother or sister, and right in the middle of this heated debate, the phone rings. And you pick it up, and, you, and, and, and it's someone that you really admire and look up to. So there you are, angry as all get out. But do you answer, yeah, what do you want? Oh, no, you don't. You say, hi there. How's my most favorite person? Oh, I'm doing great. Best day I've ever had. You see, we have the capacity to choose how we're going to express our anger. From the time that we are children, we've all developed habit patterns in which we've been given either permission or we've just learned to express our anger a certain way. Some of us learn to suppress our anger. When anger welled up inside of us, we learn to smile and, and just pretend that everything's just fine. I want to take you out, but no, this is really nice. Yeah. And, and trying to bury anger is a lot like trying to bury toxic waste in the ground. You know, you think the problem's taken care of, but months or years later, those toxins, they begin to leak. They leak out in the form of stomach ulcers or sleep disorders. They leak out in the form of bitter, cynical attitudes. Uh, when a person who's hurt us suddenly comes up in the conversation, sinful anger that's been suppressed will just suddenly erupt 
like a volcano erupting in the form of slander and negative gossip about that person, all in an attempt to make them pay for the way they hurt you. Ephesians 4.26 says, don't let the sun go down in your anger. Suppressed anger often leads to resentment, which can eat away at your soul like cancer, affecting your relationship with God and with other people, and especially with the person that you're angry with. And so some of us, we've learned to suppress our anger. Others of us have learned to express our anger in a harmful way. When we were children, some of us learned to express our anger by throwing temper tantrums and throwing things around, or both. If our parents let us have our way, guess what we learned over time? Man, having a temper tantrum works. This is great. If I want my way, I'll just kick and scream, break a few things, and bingo, I'll get what I want. Others of us, we may not have learned to throw things, but we learned to express our anger by cursing and yelling and saying demeaning things to others. We may be horrified of people who actually throw and break things or try to hurt other people. We may just think, oh my goodness. But we're perfectly okay with cursing or yelling or using our words to crucify someone. Or we learn to get our way by pouting, using the silent treatment, (laughs) not talking to someone for a week or more. And yet all of these destructive ways of acting out our sinful anger, anger, the Bible says, get rid of of this stuff, this bitterness and this rage and this anger. In other words, recognize how destructive sinful anger is. Make a decision to not act that way. Count the cost of doing so. Proverbs 29 verse 22 says, An angry man stirs up dissension, and a hot-tempered one commits many sins. Sinful anger is dangerous and it is costly. In a moment of rage, do you realize that you could lose everything. You could lose your reputation, you could use, lose your job, you could um, lose your marriage, your family, your health, even your own life. How many times have you heard of someone who was just, had just broken up with someone else, get in their car and drive like a lunatic and end up wrapping the vehicle around a telephone pole? You could lose your life. Friend, when you lose your temper, you will always lose. So first of all, when angry, stop and just say no to destructive anger. Secondly, when angry, stop and take your anger to God. Don't take it to other people, at least not initially. Don't go to people who are neither part of the problem or part of the solution. All that you do is slander and gossip about the person who hurt you and you get somebody else angry at them and you create some more dissension. Again, Proverbs 15, 18 says, an angry fool stirs up dissension. So, before you go to another person, stop, go to God. Go to Him first. Share your heart and your pain with Him. One of the ways I do this is I sit down at the computer And uh, I write a letter to God about how I'm feeling. And I tell him exactly why I feel justified to be angry with this person um, who hurt me. And at times I even write what I would like to say to that person if I was facing them, if I was face-to-face with them. And as I write out my hurt and my frustration, my desire to get even and all those things, I'm always amazed at how God uses that little exercise to calm me down, to point out some of my own stinking thinking and to see the situation from his eternal perspective and often my anger subsides and I receive wisdom and direction from the Lord about what I should do next if I do anything at all. Taking your anger to God also means you ask him to show you what's behind your anger. Is it pride, the desire to get even? 
Is it to make that person pay? Are you angry because you're, you're hurting physically? Have you ever noticed sometimes you're really short with someone that's close to you? And, and, and you can't even explain why. You just, you're just kind of ticked off. And you're just constantly, you know, sniping at this person. And you don't know why. And all of a sudden you realize that you're starving. And you just need to eat something. Are you angry because of fear? Remember the time the disciples of Jesus were caught in a vicious storm on the Sea of Galilee? And Jesus is in the back of the boat and he's sound asleep. And they are some upset because this thing's about to capsize. And so they wake him up and they say to him as he's waking up, don't you care if we drown? And did you ever notice the very next thing he says to them? He didn't say to them, why are you angry? He said to them, why are you afraid? You see, their anger was a reflection of their fear. Do you know why your parents lose it sometimes when you're late? It may be because you're late. <laughs> but most of the time, I believe it's because your parents are fearful that something has happened to you like an accident. In fact, did you hear about the, uh, the limousine had 20 people in it from a wedding party? Um, just, I just, on the way here, I heard about it. They uh, piled into the back of a car killed all 20 of them, wiped out the entire wedding party, or at least most of them. I don't know, they didn't say whether the bride and groom were in the thing or not. But you see, that's every parent's nightmare. But you see, we're often angry because of fear. We may not understand it, but it's fears underneath it. Furthermore, at times, we're also angry because of frustration. For example, you're way behind, you're stressed out, and you're in a rush, and the person in the car in front of you is driving 10 miles under the speed limit or the person in front of you at Starbucks is taking her jolly time digging through her elephant sized purse you know to get out her three little coin containers to pay for her frappuccino with quarters dimes and nickels and by the time you get to the counter, you forget why you're there, you're so hot and you're so frustrated, you've forgotten everything and you need to go home, shave and shower again. <laughs> you're angry because you're frustrated. So take some time to stop. Go to God with your anger and ask him to show you, Lord, what, what's behind this anger? What's going on here? And if it's pride... Or if it's a desire to get even. Or if it's, a if it's a fear. Or if it's insecurity. Or if it's just plain impatience. Or any other sinful reason. Stop right there and confess it to him. Refuse to make it worse by acting out your sinful anger. Now, in addition to asking God to help you understand what's behind your anger, ask God to help you understand the other person's point of view that just hurt you. Everything inside of you will scream against you doing that. But God asks us to. You see, the key to not sinning in our anger is understanding. The more understanding you have, the more understanding you will be. Proverbs 14, 29 says, Whoever is patient has great understanding, but one who is quick-tempered displays folly. I mean, how many times have you found yourself thinking or even saying to someone who is angry at you, but you don't understand if you understood you wouldn't be angry with me ask yourself could the conclusions that I've come to be wrong could they be based on false incomplete distorted information have I talked with the person that I'm angry with do I know the full story the more you understand the other person's point of view, the more understanding 
you will be. And so before taking your anger out on someone else, stop and take your anger to God. Thirdly, when angry, go to the person that hurt you. Follow the principles laid out in Matthew chapter 18. You know, in Matthew 5, Jesus said, if there's a conflict between you and another person, go and be reconciled with him first, even before you come to a worship service like this. And I don't think that Jesus was all bent out of shape or suggesting that you don't dare come and worship, uh, you know, before you do that. I think what he was saying is, fundamentally, is do it quickly. You know, don't let it fester. Don't nurse it. Don't let it go on for months or years. Now, if you're afraid to approach the other person, well, tell the Lord about your fear. Ask him for his strength and for his courage. If you're afraid the person's going to reject you, the person's going to humiliate you even more, submit yourself to the Lord. You know, someone once said, you know, he who is on the floor can't fall. Humble yourself before the Lord. You won't be able to fall anywhere if the person humiliates you even more. Remember that you are not responsible for how the other person responds to you. Your responsibility is to do what God's calling you to do. And then having surrendered it all to God in prayer, go. Remember, email and letters, they're wonderful for encouraging someone. But if you have something sensitive or hard to say to someone, don't use email. Don't use letters new. You go to them face to face. Someone has said, if you don't talk it out with someone, you're going to take it out on someone. And that's so true. Now, before you talk to them, carefully think through what you're going to say. If you're afraid that you might not say something in a life-giving way, then write it out. And when you get together with them, just say, you know what, forgive me, but I want to say this right, and I want to say it with the right spirit, so I'm just going to read this. Be honest, be truthful. Help them to understand how they hurt you. And, and, and do so with the utmost of humility. Proverbs 15.1 says, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Go with the intent of restoring the relationship, not hammering them into the ground. There. Hope you feel better. Don't go there determined to prove that they're wrong and you're right. Put yourself in their shoes and try to understand what's going on in their life and what may have played a role in what they said or did to you. Someone once said, hurt people hurt people. And that's so true. Often when someone hurts others, it's because they themselves are hurting. So be as calm as you can be. Don't attack, just explain. Be ready to listen, be willing to admit your own mistakes. The intent is not to excuse their behavior or to excuse your own. What you're wanting to do is to come to the place where you can genuinely love them and treat them as if they had never sinned against you in the first place. So when you're angry, go to the person who hurt you. And then fourthly and finally, when angry, surrender your pride to God. This is the biggie. Pride's the big one, folks. The reason there's so much anger and relational conflict in the world is because there's just too much pride in our hearts. We're still too much in love with our, ourselves and wanting our own way. We live in a me-centered world. The Apostle James put it this way. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? The word desires in that verse comes from the same Greek word from which we get the word hedonism. Do you know what hedonism is? Hedonism means to have a strong desire to satisfy myself. It's all about me and my happiness. In other words, we're at the center of our universe, not God. And as a result, we look to those in our lives. We look to our parents. We look to our siblings. We look to our spouses. We look to our friends. We look to our children to meet our deep-seated needs. And when they don't come through, guess what? We get angry. 
And we have all our different ways, which we talked about already, of how we act out that anger. And yet God never intended for the world to revolve around my ego or your ego. He's the center of the universe, amen? And until he's the center of our lives, we will never be free from all of the striving and the emptiness and the subtle and the not-so-subtle competing that goes on between us and all of the anger and the envy and the relational conflict that tends to accompany it. In verse 6, James says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will lift you up. See, pride is us trying to, me trying to lift me up. You submit to him, and in his time, in his way, he will lift you up. James essentially says, you don't have the power in yourself to find victory over anger and dissension. So submit your life to to Christ, and he will live his life through you. When I realize that God is God and I'm not, and that I'm perfectly loved by my creator God, and I submit myself to him completely, you know what? I am freed of me. I am freed to think about other people and to serve others rather than myself. I don't have to prove myself anymore to anyone. I don't have to compete and win to reinforce my feelings or my self-worth. My worth is no longer defined or dependent on what I can do or what I have or how famous I am. No, my worth is based on who I am in Jesus Christ. My soul is full of Jesus because I'm a child of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And as I begin to understand the scorn and the abuse and and the pain and the indignities that Jesus suffered on the cross out of love for me and in order to set me free, I am increasingly compelled to extend His grace and His patience and His forgiveness to the friend who slandered me, to my spouse who betrayed me to the pastor who failed me to the child who disobeyed me to the parent who hurt and disappointed me if God extended such amazing grace and forgiveness to me on the cross how can I not extend the same grace and forgiveness to others On the other hand, if I won't forgive, if I continue to seethe in anger and resentment and bitterness, hold on to a grudge against someone, that is a clear indication that that I'm still at the center of my own universe. That I really haven't surrendered completely to the Lord who made my forgiveness possible by His grace. And so... Is there any sinful anger in your heart towards someone? Isn't it time to let that anger go? You know, a few years ago, my wife, Gwen, and I were traveling, and the um, airline company, as they were chucking suitcases, I guess they, they damaged one of the wheels on it. And so... Um, This suitcase was a real pain to lug around. I won't say whose suitcase it was, except it was an incredibly heavy suitcase (laughs) filled with lotions and creams and other such useless products. Anyways, anyways, lugging that suitcase was one big pain. And I was never so happy when I got to that conveyor belt, you know, where you unload your suitcase, and I was able to unload it. Now here's the thing. Some of you are hauling around a suitcase plumb full. Plumb full of regret. 
You really blew it somewhere in the past. You feel like a failure. And you've been lugging that failure around ever since. And you've believed the lie that that Satan keeps whispering into your ear that it's too late, that you've blown it so badly. There's too much water under the bridge, you know. Too much time's gone by. There isn't a chance. There isn't a hope for you to be restored, for, for you to step out and do the new thing that God's calling you to do. Some of you have mothballed your musical gifts or your leadership talent or some other talent that God's given to you because somewhere in your past, someone made fun of you. Someone said something very unkind to you, embarrassed you in front of others. Someone alluded or perhaps flat out told you that, you know, you're a loser, that you're never going to succeed, that whatever it is, and you believed them. And ever since then, you've been listening to the lies of Satan. You've been lugging around the memory of that put down and the insecurity and the fear that comes with it and you've refused to step out and be the person that God made you to be. Others of you were really hurt, really embarrassed by someone in the past and you've been carrying around that bitterness ever since. Your suitcase is chock full of regrets or fears or lies or insecurities or anger or resentments. Let me ask you, like, how long are you going to lug around that suitcase? How long are you going to let others, let yourself be chained to the hurts, the lies of Satan and others and prevent Christ from setting you free? How long are you going to miss God's best for you? And all he wants to do in your life and through your life. Would you just stand for a moment? What's God saying to you? And maybe even more important, what are you going to do about it in light of what we've just talked about? I just want to remind you that Jesus died and he rose again. That wasn't just something he decided to do one day for, you know, fill in time. That was motivated out of incredible love for you and for me. He did that to set you and me free from the heavy suitcase of resentment and hurt and fear that you've been lugging around. He's made a way for you to break the chain of bondage. But you have to take the next step. So here's what I'd like you to do and at least invite you to do. In a moment, we're going to sing a a song that's really all about surrender. And if you have a suitcase that that's keeping you chained to the past, the regrets of the past, the failures of the past, or the put-downs of the past, or preventing you from being the person that God made you to be. Then as we sing, I'm going to invite you to bring that suitcase of hurt. Bring it up here to the altar and just say a prayer in which you sincerely confess those things that you're responsible for, you confess those to God. For example, like resentment that you've been holding on to against someone, you confess that. And or renounce any lies of Satan or lies that have come to you from another person that's keeping you from being the person that God made you to be. And instead, you embrace and receive his truth and your identity in him and you surrender it all to him. Let him have control of every area of your life inside and out. It's going to require humility. But come. And then after you've spent some time with the Lord in prayer, just leave that suitcase, you leave that hurt right here at the altar. 
Because right at the altar, it's the foot of a cross. You leave it at the cross. And then you go back to your seat. And thank Jesus for making it possible. Thanks for listening. We hope this message has impacted you. We'd like to challenge you to take it one step further and get connected. For any questions or prayer, please visit our website at cschurch.ca. You can also like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter.